Lord in my blessing and Merry Christmas to everyone. As again, again, like I say, God has blessed us to come together to bring to you and present to you the lesson for the day. And it's uh, not often, but it happens where Christmas actually falls on the Sunday. And that's what we have here today. And we're grateful to God for this because, like I say, this year is just about come and almost gone. And God has taken us through another year. But we just thank God for each and every day and uh, certainly give him the glory, the honor, and praise for all that he does for us. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you again for the blessing, O oh Lord, to be able to understand that a Savior has come into the world, one who died for us, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we as Christians will carry this gospel message wherever we go, that men and women and boys and girls will have that same opportunity as we did to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, and bless us as we go forth in this lesson. And thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this point in our life and through this year. We give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson today will be coming from Luke, first chapter, uh, the 46th through the 55th verse. And the lesson title is According to the Promise. And we're going to see the promises that God has blessed us with through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we want to look at the response of uh, specifically Mary, his mother, in this uh, passage of Scripture. And just helps us to understand what we need to do as Christians as well, too, when God blesses us. How we need to lift him up and give him the glory, the honor, and praise for all that he has done for us as well, too. So let's look at this Luke's version of the Christmas story or part of the script, the early parts of the Christmas story, not necessarily the Christmas story that he uh, presents with Christ being born, but it helps us to understand how things got, um, uh, came about and how it started, even though a lot of it's not in my lesson, but we will see Mary, his mother, uh, being grateful for the privilege of being able to carry the, the Christ child and for her cousin Elizabeth as well too. Before we get into our lesson, let's leave, read a little bit of a background so it kind of helps set the tone for where we are and what's going on so we'll know where we're at when we get into our lesson. It says, Mary sang the beautiful words of today's scripture passages while she was visiting Elizabeth, her relative. Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, was an elderly, childless couple. They had prayed many years for a child until they reached the age where they no longer expected God to answer this request. Both Elizabeth and Zacharias were of the tribe of Aaron, so Zacharias was in rotation for serving at the temple in Jerusalem. After Luke's introduction to his gospel, uh, records he plunges right into the story of the birth of John the Baptist. It was Zacharias' turn to serve at the temple, a great privilege for a godly Jew. As he went in to burn incense, suddenly the angel Gabriel was standing beside the incense altar. Zechariah had the same reaction that all who had ever been visited by an angel had. He was afraid. After telling him not to be afraid, Gabriel told Zechariah that God was answering his and Elizabeth's prayer for a child, a very special child, that they were to name John. Unfortunately, Zacharias found this hard to believe, and so he became speechless until after the birth of John, their baby. John grew up to be the prophet we know as John the Baptist, or the baptizer. Word must have traveled in spite of lack of modern communication devices, because Mary heard that her elderly relative was now pregnant. Mary was on the other side of the age spectrum, probably only around 15 years of age, the age where women in those days usually got married. Gabriel had also visited Mary to tell her that she would be pregnant in the most miraculous way ever. Mary was going to give birth to the Son of God, and this would be a virgin birth. Shortly after Gabriel's announcement to Mary, she hurried to see Elizabeth about 80 mile, as about an 80-mile hike. As soon as she walked into the door and Elizabeth heard her, Baby John in her womb leaped in praise at the presence of the baby whom was growing within Mary. At this time, Elizabeth was already six months pregnant while Mary's pregnancy had just begun. 
After Elizabeth had finished praising God for the coming Savior, Mary began singing a song of praise to God that reminds us very much of Hannah's song of praise when she became pregnant with baby Samuel in answer to her prayers. The similarity of Mary's prayer to others in the Bible make us think that Mary studied scripture and meditated upon that even in an era when women had little access to formal education. So this kind of sets us a story, uh, uh, sets us a, a base uh, for the story uh, as we begin to get into our lesson. Kind of helps us to understand what has happened at to this point. The angel has visited Zachariah and Elizabeth, elderly uh, relatives of Mary. Uh, of course, the Bible, if you read the whole first chapter of Luke, all this, you can see all this in the first chapter of Luke, that uh, Elizabeth was a barren, and, uh, and so God still answered their prayers, even in their old age, uh, because we can see no matter how far we go uh, or how old we are, God can still use us in his plan if it's his desire to do so. So God has blessed Zachariah and Elizabeth. He has blessed Mary. Mary is now at the home of Elizabeth and Zacharias and, and just confirming all that the angel has, has said to her and what she has heard. Now we're going to see Mary's song of praise that she gives to the Lord for all that has happened. So this is where we open up in our lesson today uh, with Mary in the home of Elizabeth and uh, giving praises to God for all that it has done. Let's look at verse 46 and verse 47. And it says of Luke, and it says, And Mary said, My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit what has rejoiced in God my Savior. Note, in chapters 1, 39 through 56, it is labeled as joy. Now that Mary knew that she was to become a mother and that her kinsman, Elizabeth, would give birth in three months, she wanted to see Elizabeth so that they could rejoice together. Joy is the major theme of this section, uh, as you see three persons rejoicing uh, in the Lord. First, the joy of Elizabeth. We see that in verses 39 through 45. Second, the joy of the unborn son, John, verses 41 and 44. And third, the joy of Mary, verses 46 through 56, six, which is our lesson for today. Mary's joy was a joy that compelled her to lift her voice in a hymn of praise. The fullness of the Spirit should lead to joyful praise in our lives, and so should the fullness of the Word. Mary's song contains quotations from and references to the Old Testament, which we just mentioned, scriptures, especially the Psalms and the songs of Hannah in 1 Samuel, 2, 1 Samuel 2 chapter, the first through the 10th verse. Mary hid God's word in her heart and turned it into a song. The song is called the Magnificent. Her great desire was to magnify the Lord, not herself. She used the phrase, he hath, eight times as she recounted what God has done for her, for, for these three recipients of his blessings. And let's look at the first recipient as we get into our lesson of what God did for Mary. And this is what she's going to talk about uh, now as what, for what God did for Mary. So, so Mary's sex example for all of us is, is in that to the point that when God does something great for us, as he has done for Mary, because we got to realize Mary's going to do something that no other woman on the face of this earth will ever do. And that's to give birth to the, to, uh, the Christ child. And that was a great honor, and it was a very great honor, and 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 just understanding, uh, and we'll pick this up in just a minute how she felt about herself and how she looked at herself not being worthy or handmade. Uh, then look at her cousin Elizabeth, who was very old in age and past, no doubt, the childbearing age, but God still, and, and she was barren at, at that, but God still fixed it. So both of these women still could be blessed and still could be part of the plan of God in a major way uh, when it comes to our salvation. So let's see what God did um, for Mary. It says, after arriving at Elizabeth's house and confirming all that was told to her from the angel, Mary asked spontaneously 
and glorifies God. Look what she says in verse one. She says, my soul, uh, and Mary said, my soul does magnify the Lord. Uh, and my spirit has rejoiced in my God, my Savior. Which indicates a total involvement of the whole of self, emotion, emotionally and spiritual in the praise of God. But to begin with, what had God done for Mary? He had saved her because she said, well, he was the God, her Savior. So again, Mary puts her whole self into this praise of God not haphazardly and, and not just um, uh, lackingly, but she, she, she puts everything to it because, she, again, like I said, she realizes what God has done for her. And again, if we just think about what God has done for us and how he's brought us through and the many things that he has blessed us with, it may not be to this degree, but God has done a lot of things for us in our life. If it's nothing more than just having our right mind and our health to see one day to the other, because we know many have been called on they have not been at this moment as we are now. And, 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 and it's just amazing the many blessful things that God gives to us. And all we have to do is just say thank you. Have a grateful attitude for the thing that God has given us. And we see that in Mary. So she said that her soul does magnify the Lord because now she's pouring everything that she has from a spiritual and emotional side into giving God the glory and the praise. And then she says, my soul. And what is the soul? Soul generally means self or inner being. It is the center of and makes up the whole being. The soul is the seat of feelings, emotion, desire, and affection. So again, everything is being put into what Mary is saying uh, and how she's feeling about God. And then she says, it also, my soul, what does magnify? And magnify means to make great, extol, or to esteem highly. And this is what she said. And she said, well, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my salvation. And the word spirit here, and oftentimes is synonymous with soul. Here, spirit speaks of the rational or mental disposition, the core of the inner being. Mary implores the totality of her being, the soul and the spirit, to glorify God in a grateful worship of, of God, her Savior. So Mary puts all herself into this praise, all of it. And that's what we should do for God. We shouldn't hold back for God because like I say, in times past, a lot of times if, if we was in the world and our certain song came up or certain things happened, we would get out there and just do what we, what we, what we knew to do, put everything we had in because that was what uh, gave us the inspiration we needed. But the same thing should be done in reverse for Christ, but even greater, that once we understand and continuously understand what God has done for us, we need to pour all our inner being into him as uh, Mary uh, uh, had did for Christ. Now, let's look at the second thing that God did for Mary. Let's look at verses 48 and 49. Look what he says, for he has regarded uh, the lowest state of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he is what the mighty, for he that is mighty has done this unto, done this to me, gave great things, and holy is his name. Now let's let's go back and look at the second thing that God did for for, for Mary. Okay, was that he chose her to what to be the mother of the Messiah? We see that in verse uh, forty-eight, because he said. So her reason for rejoicing, this was her reason for rejoicing and gratitude, is that what he has what regarded her in her lowest state. Now, what does the word regard means? It means he was mindful of her and looked with favor on her. No doubt there were others who could have been chosen, but God chose her. The Lord had indeed showered his grace on her. So Mary knew that this was a very special honor. And like it's like the script, like it was just suggested, scripture never said that Mary was the only person that could have received this, but God just chose her for whatever reason it was to come through her. So it it it, it just made Mary feel so great that God uh, found favor with her among the many people, no doubt that could he could have chosen, uh, but he passed by and gave it to her this great honor. And then, like I say, to have this great honor that no other person would ever have in this life. 
And then she goes on to say, uh, not only did he regard her, but he said in low estate. And the word low estate means insignificant person. So Mary realized that she was not ve a very important person of status and clout or anything like that. But God still uses the high, but he also still uses the low people of this life, or those who, who society does not look at as the important, uh, uh, or those who, who bears the most, uh, brings the most to, uh, uh, to life and what it can offer. God sometimes takes a nobody and turns them into a somebody. And that's why Mary said that she was of low estate. And then she also uses the word that she was a handmaid. And the word handmaid, uh, which means female slave. This is the lowest position one can get in the Jewish custom. Women and slaves uh, were disregarded as the lowest class in the Jewish community of the day. They were relegated to the background, to the place of dishonor. To be both women and slaves uh, makes her place even worse society has no regard for her. So again, it helps us to show that God reached back and got somebody who even society did not honor or respect, which is a woman. A woman had very little clout or very little voice, and matter of fact, none uh, in the old, in, in, during biblical days. And in many ways, they were seen as just property of men. And that's the sad part of life that women have had to struggle throughout history because of the narrow mindedness of men who always felt like the women were there for them and that was it. But God has taken this lonely, lowly little girl and he is, trans he is transforming her life to, to be a very beautiful and wonderful thing to, to the point that she says in the latter part of verse uh, 48, that henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. That's what happens when God puts his hands on you. Uh, and, and blesses you. Nobody can take that blessing away. So she says, I'll be blessed through all generations. She'll call me blessed, which means every generation will acknowledge her as the one blessed and most fortunate woman among all women as the mother of the Messiah. Mary is uniquely blessed. No one else uh, will have that blessing. And, and, and then, like I said, it takes a certain kind of person also to be able to be in that position too, to understand that nobody else would be, have the same honor as, as she does. So God knows the right person to pick and the right person to put in position and the right person who would be able to handle certain things in a way that makes sense and not, as we say, get the big head and think they're so much better than everybody else and stick their chest out. So God knows exactly who he's getting. He's getting the right person for the right job, for the right thing, and Mary was that person, even her lowly state, um, uh, God uh, still blesses her in a mighty way. So how does he how does he do this thing? Look what he, how does this, all this happen? Look at verse 49. He says, For he that is mighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name. That's how all this came about by the Almighty God, our Father. God has regard, God has regard for her. He has looked upon Mary with favor and has given her a place of honor. The magnitude and extent of her elevation is bought uh, to bear the person who made it possible, the mighty and the holy. When God raises us up, no one can do what bring us down. And that's the uh, and that's the uh, important thing about life that we must understand. When God has his hands on us, there's nobody who can touch us and nobody can do anything to us other than what God would allow. So God has blessed Mary in a very special way and uh, he has given her very special honor. But again, like we said, it takes a very special person to understand those things and be able to receive them in a way that makes sense and not get big-headed and not feel that they're way above everybody else. Because just like anybody else, she still has to accept Christ as Lord and Savior uh, of her life. Verse 50. And let's look at the reci second recipient uh, of the blessing, what God did for Israel for us. Verse 50 says, His mercy is on them 
uh, that fear him from generation to generation. Okay? Uh, fear. What does the word fear mean in verse 50? Fear meaning those who venerate or reverence him. The fear of God is verified by the people's obedience in the keeping of God's law. God's mercy is according specifically to the people of Israel in keeping with God's promises, which started with Abraham. So the correct response is, uh, how do these things happen? Because of the respect and the fear and awe and the understanding that we have of God and what he can do. When God reaches out and gets people, again, he gets those persons who are in a certain position in life and who can fulfill this plan in the best way. Now, sometimes God, even like we say, we, we read in the, in the Old Testament where Cyrus, who uh, who rescued the Jews from uh, captivity, sometimes God goes outside the, the Jewish race and gets people to bless and to do things in a certain way. So it helps us to understand in all situations, God can get anybody, male, female, Jew or Gentile, wherever your position, high or low in life, God can take you and use you. Uh, in a way that makes sense for his plan. So uh, so, so God took Mary and God blessed him because why? Because uh, he's mighty and has done great things and what she says, and holy is his name. Let's look at verse, uh, uh, verse 51 through 53, where it says, Mary names three specific groups to whom God has been merciful, the helpless, the humble, and the hungry. Let's read verse 51. He has showed strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their heart. So verse 51 says that he has showed strength with his arm and has scattered the proud. The word scattered is figuratively used here and has a military or an agricultural idea in view. In its military sense, the strong, proud, army which uh, relies on its own strength without God is brought to nothing and is driven and dispersed by a stronger force. In its agricultural sense, scattered refers to the winnowing, pro winnowing process where this chafe is separated from the wheat and is blown away or, or bored in the air by the wind. So we know in that process, when you throw the wheat up in the air, the lighter chafe will fly off and the heavier wheat will fall to the ground. So it's a separation process. So God, God does this. He shows strength with his arm and he scatters the proud in their imagination and, and in their heart. So God shows how he takes, like I say, there's three specific groups to whom God has shown mercy. The helpless is one of them, what we just read in verse 51. So anybody who is taken advantage of, anybody who uh, has been belittled or, or, or done, have gone without because of others, God can turn this table around and he can make this thing fit for those who are on top. Now they become on bottom and those who are on bottom, they can rise to the top. So he helps the helpless in verse 51. Verse 52, he looks at the humble and it says, he has put down the mighty from their seats, verse 52, and exalted them of low degree. The common people of that day were almost helpless when it came to justice and civil rights. They were often hungry, downtrodden, and discouraged. And there was no way for them to fight for the system, fight the system, a secret society, uh, fight the system. A secret society of patriot Jewish extremists called the Zeliots used violent means to oppose wrong, but their activity only made matters worse. Mary saw the Lord turning everything upside down, the wheat uh, be dethroned, the wheat dethroned the mighty, the humble scattered, the proud and nobodies are exalted, the hungry are filled, and the rich end up poor. The grace of God works contrary to the thought and the ways of the world system. The church is something that is bad. The, the, the church is, is something like the band of men that gathered around David. And we'll see that in 1 Samuel 22 and 2. 
So this is what God does. And to read verse 50, 53 is where, look what he said. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has what sent away. So God has a way of turning things around. And the amazing thing about God, he look, He always works in opposite of what the world. So what the world thinks is good, God thinks is bad. And what God, uh, what, what people that are up in the world, God God elevates the, the low and, and, and the humble uh, eventually. So we need to learn to have the proper attitude and a proper position when it comes to God and the things that God has for us. And we see that, especially with Mary, uh, in the position that God is putting her in uh, as being the mother of his son. So God blesses those and brings those who he can use who God knows will fall perfectly within his plan for what he has. Now, let's close this lesson out and let's look at um, the third recipient of God's blessing. Uh, God's faithful, God is faithful in keeping his promise to Abraham by sending the Messiah. So let's look at the promise to the Israel, uh, verse 54 and 55. And it says, uh, it reads like this, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So we're looking at God's blessing upon Israel for all that he said he would do. Now let's read that verse 54 and verse 55 in the New Living Translation. And it says like this, He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be remerciful, for he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his children forevermore. Here, many celebrates God's mercy to Israel, just as he promised Abraham and his descendants. God has kept his promise in keeping his word to Israel and blessing them uh, partake in this promise, not forgetting his promise, but remembering his mercy. The act of mercy, the act of mercy is an old promise or old covenant God made to Abraham and to all of his generations after him. It is a living covenant to all humankind that is fulfilled in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we see here that God never forgets his promises. God always fulfills what he said uh, that he would do. And going back, even back to Abraham several hundred years before, uh, God promised Abraham uh, his seeds would be greater than the stars and the sands along the seashore. And God kept that promise through all those who come through to him through by Christ Jesus, that we all become heirs to the promise of Abraham for what God made with him. So we see God gets people and uses people who has the proper attitude and who couldn't receive his blessings and do the things that God intended. Uh, for us to do. Now, does that make us perfect? No. We still all fall short. We still do things that we shouldn't do, but we, but God still knows the person that he can use and that uh, he can have uh, for his plan of salvation. So we see Mary today giving God the glory, giving God the praise for which what we all like we say all of us should do. So we should go back and look at Mary and look at Elizabeth, look at Zacharias, look at the whole uh, first chapter of Luke. And just see how we should react when God bestows blessings upon us in our life uh, and be grateful for all the things that he has done for us. This concludes our lesson. God bless you. God hold you. Hopefully, uh, this day and all days will be blessed by God to you. And uh, hopefully everybody has a very Merry Christmas and a safe one. And until we have this blessed time again, and again, hopefully something was said today would, that would encourage you and strengthen you throughout this journey. But until we have this time again, if it be God's will, you take care and God bless you. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.